at the end of the day, if you can capture this idea that uh, they do want to be role models and teams have the ability to deliver value and deliver purpose that the traditional company can try to do and really should work hard to do, but it's kind of easy to get players to do that. Hi, I'm Rachel Krauss. And I'm Carol Stern. And we are here to explore and unpack the essence, architecture, and DNA of purpose across industries, professions, relationships, and even within paradox. So on this podcast, we're going to unlock the stories and the journeys of our guests. We're hoping to unlock pathways to grow, to gain, and to give. And for the next couple of episodes, we're going to be playing on purpose. Exploring the intersection of purpose and sports. Game on. I'm really excited to dive right in with our guest, Don Garber, Commissioner of Major League Soccer since 1999 and CEO of Soccer United Marketing, as well as a member of the United States Soccer Federation Board of Directors and a friend for over 40 years. So, Don, you know, we've known each other a long time and I know your story, but let's start by sharing with our listeners, how'd you get where you got? Well, it's a it's a long winding road, Carol. So I'll I'll do it briefly so that we can get sort of to the purpose of, of all this. But you know, I was an unlikely guy to end up being in the sports business. As as you know, we I went to college, graduated, traveled a bit, had no idea what I wanted to do, and ended up as one of the early marketing guys at the National Football League when the league was first sort of getting into the business of exploiting its intellectual property. And a bunch of people were hired all at the same time, and uh, we all went out and built you know, what is today the, the marketing business for the NFL. And I worked there for 17 years, and um, nobody really knew what sports marketing was at that time. There were no sports marketing degree programs. Uh, you just had a lot of people who cared a lot about football, and we were in a position to make it big. And make Monday Night Football what it is and make the Super Bowl what it is and figure out how to get people like Michael Jackson to do the halftime shows. And during that period of time, I was sort of the creative guy at the league. There were a lot of uh, hardcore Ivy League NBA people, people like you and I weren't. And I ended up uh, being asked for the last number of years to launch an international uh, business for the National Football League. And that meant opening up offices over the world and et cetera, et cetera. But I reported to Robert Kraft and Lamar Hunt, two well-known NFL team owners, and they founded Major League Soccer. And I bumped into them at an owner's meeting. They had a commissioner that was there for a couple of years. The league was really in a lot of trouble, was about to go out of business. And Robert said to me, what do you know about soccer? I said, absolutely nothing. He said, you'd be a great commissioner, figuring you'd be able to push me around and do all that stuff. So Long story short, that was uh, almost 25 years ago. It's been a long, but tiring, but but fruitful and uh, and uh, really uh, rewarding life. The most rewarding part is not just making a lot of money for a lot of sports team owners and giving a lot of players an opportunity to, you know, do what they do, which is entertain fans. But as we'll talk about today, how could you take the power of sport and the connectivity that our teams have in their markets? and players who actually in their heart, the best ones really do want to give back and package all that up so that we can be more than just a, the fifth major league in the United States. And that's what we'll talk about today. Great. You know, so let, let's stay with that for a minute, okay? Um, at a certain point, you created MLS Works. Bring us there. How, how did that happen? You know, I, I, uh, you know, I had a, a, a long history at learning what the NFL did to become relevant. And, and it's fun for listeners who might just be interested in sports. There are a couple of things if you think about in our business, there are lots of sports leagues and a couple of them are really successful. The NFL's point of difference was the games were on Sunday for the most part, then Monday night and now they're games all the time. But it, it was destination uh, experiences and you had the ability to use media to popularize and promote your players. Uh, but I also learned that uh, people really cared and, and my job during the middle part of my career there was to take the helmets off the players and try to personalize a very violent sport, right? It, the sport's beauty is really the, this unique, quintessentially American quality, which is a bunch of guys going out and, you know, fighting like warriors. But when you took their helmets off, they were good guys. And so I, I had launched all sorts of grassroots programs and trying to 
uh, get kids to connect with players in clubs. And, and I man, ran that group at the NFL and then did a number of things there with NFL Films to try to tell those stories. So when I came over to the soccer world and realized that MLS needed to have relevance in the community, even though we were really fledgling, the first thing you're going to do is figure out how do you connect in the community. You know, you ha we went through, in my journey, it's been 40 years in pro sports for me, and there's been lots of different journeys where players who have all sorts of challenges and continue to, to do that. But at the end of the day, if you can capture this idea that uh, they do want to be role models and teams have the ability to deliver value and deliver purpose that the traditional company can try to do and really should work hard to do, but it's kind of easy to get players to do that. We had an event the other day where we had 500 boys and girls club kids playing in a field and get some of our legend players to kick the ball around with them, and they go crazy. That might be a little different if you were going to do that with a corporate outing. They might still do it, but the idea that they would want to be with an athlete gives them something memorable, particularly in today's social media world. So um, year one, we decided to launch MLS Works and hired people to do that. Carol, you've met them over the years, and uh, with few resources, but a lot of energy. We got our teams and hired local, what we call community relations people at our teams, in addition to people that sell tickets and develop players and do all that sort of stuff. And that's been going on for 25 years and proud of it. And uh, you, you are close to what the NBA has done and what the NFL does with NFL charities. And all leagues have an obligation, not just an opportunity to give back. And it makes good business sense, but it's also sort of a responsibility to be a good corporate citizen. And can we talk a little bit about the business sense? You just touched on that. What does that, what does that look like? What does that translate into? When you talk about purpose for individual players, for teams, for communities, spanning geographies, what does that look like in terms of the translation and the impact on the business side? You know, it's, it's a good question. It's evolved over the years. You know, in the old days, it was getting players out and doing autograph signings and trying to find ways that you can just, you know, the United Way programs with the NFL. It just sort of made sense during that era. Today, it's much more socially oriented. It's much more about racial and social justice and hiring the right people that are going to find ways that you can make these decisions to drive good business opportunity. So in, in today's world, you can hire people in community relations and in the DEI space, and they're delivering ROI. And that's a, that's a really mind shift from what it was. The early days was an expense. Now you can quantify the value of going out and hiring, in our case, trying to get more coaches of color. And we have so many Hispanic players and a Hispanic fan base. And how could we have a point of difference against the other leagues and going into communities and and finding opportunities there that might be connected with community groups that can create job opportunities, that can create business opportunities, and connecting those dots. And to me, that's a table stake. I mean, you, you, you have to do it, but if you do it right, then it can turn into a real business opportunity. In our league, we're the hungry nibble. After 25 years, we are still a, uh, a challenger brand, and everything that we do has a mind to how do we ensure that we're leaving a legacy, but that a legacy has to have value? Uh, and I, I, I can't imagine any company not doing it this way. Today's world, and I think you guys are in the right spot in talking about this, you have to deliver ROI on all these programs. It's not charity. Knowing that, you know, if I'm a, a new player and I just signed, does somebody talk to me about purpose? Or does, it, does that evolve for me from you? Well, this will be fun because you got to talk to them about a lot of things, right? And and all leagues have players have different challenges depending on the economics and what their backgrounds are. And we have a player engagement group that is connected to, we actually call it player advancement. So it's not just about how do you ensure that they're paying their taxes and how do you ensure that they're managing their money you're really trying to keep them out of harm's way. And mm -hmm. particularly in our league, we have players from 77 different countries. So it's acceptable for a player who's coming in from Argentina or Colombia or Uruguay who's coming from Africa as opposed to a traditional you know, college sports experience. Managing that dynamic, multicultural, multi-languages is really hard. And the group that manages that also manages our, what I'll call our community space, our MLS Works program. 
also manages our diversity, equity, inclusion space, and it's all captured in a way that we're connecting our dots because these are not uh, programs that you can put in cylinders. You know, they have to all be connected. So when you sit down with players in preseason, you got to talk to them about a lot of things. But then we bring in a group from MLS Works and talk to them about, you know, A, it is good for your commercial opportunity to be perceived as something more than just a player. But in their hearts, that's what they really want to do. I mean, no, they all ought to, and we're trying to sign those players that want to do that more often than not. When we signed David Beckham, that was not hard. That was just within him. You know, he just loved it. He was an engaging guy. When Lionel Messi comes in, he's just a guy that loves being around a bunch of little kids and loves being around people. So guys like that, you don't have to spend a lot of time with. Our event the other day had players you never heard of, and they volunteer for that because it just rounds out their experience. Now, by the way, they wear shorts to work every day. <laughs> so right. It's not a bad life. It's not a bad no, life. Right, right, right. You do try to uh, find ways that they can think about what's life going to look like after they hang up their proverbial boots and the more work that they could spend rounding out. Most of them are not going to college, particularly in the soccer space. So they're learning about life as athletes and we're trying to help them in that journey. And a big part of that journey is be sure that your kids are thinking about you when you retire in ways very differently than you were thinking about yourself when you were 15 or 16 or 17 years old. The other leagues do a great job at this, Carol, and you know you're so close to the NBA, and every league has a different dynamic. In the NFL, it's probably more focused on what not to do, and then our league, it's very focused on what to do. To do, But yeah. it's very active. And what about, like, sponsors? You know, do, do the sponsors come to the table around purpose? Another great question. MLS Works early days, it was a cost center. Now I would actually say that MLS Works is a, uh, a revenue generator. It's a programming element of corporate uh, sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So what better way is there to, to do good and have drive value at the same time? Absolutely. You know, if we get and more it, of that, then our business will be in a good spot. No, which is clearly, I think, where we're coming from is that you don't have to give up profit to do purpose or purpose to get profit, you know, that, that they are truly interwoven. So, And part of that also translates into the functional elements. So is purpose a business function or is purpose a business foundation? So because that nexus will also dictate the opportunity in terms of translating purpose into profit and and bringing those two together. I think it's changing, and, I, and you're right in that we're literally right in the, the front door of that now. It's all going on within the last couple of years where teams and leagues are looking at it as a, as a revenue opportunity. You know, do good and do well. Right, but right. I think that's an evolution, and, and I think you're in the right spot to be thinking about how could you get the corporate world to be thinking about this is not an expense. But it's a life expense, right? you got to check it off because this is what we should be doing. At least I think that's what people should be doing. But if you do it right, it can become a real opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Take it up a level. Take it out of the league and, and into, you know, we got the World Cup coming soon. So plans around purpose? Yeah. You know, it's uh, for our country is still an emerging soccer nation. I spent most of my career on that. It's, it's not as much of a story of an explanation today as it was. You know, we had 10 million fans come through our, our doors, our stadium doors last year, and that's a lot of people coming through. So soccer is continuing to grow in ways that are, are, we're obviously very excited about. The World Cup is going to take it to a level that people truly will just find shocking. Uh, there'll be millions and millions and millions of tickets sold, and uh, the cities that are the host cities, both in Canada, United States, and Mexico, this will be the first World Cup in three different countries, uh, are going to awesome. stop. I mean, it's really yeah, exciting. It's going to be remarkable. And that chairs, you know, Phil Murphy is the chair of the one here in New York. And most of our team owners are the chairs of the host committees in cities across the country. So the interconnectivity connectivity with MLS and the Women's League and all the other grassroots programs is is intentional. But the real idea is what happens in 2027, right? The road to the World Cup, this rocket fuel that will drive our sport, we're all who are part of the ecosystem are working hard to take advantage of. But what goes on 10 years after that? Meeting yesterday with the folks that are running that on, how do we ensure that we're connecting the cities throughout North America with a purpose? Mm -hmm. And that purpose is still being worked on today. What are those programs that we can do to be sure that every single kid who wants to play soccer in these three countries has an opportunity to do so? 
in our world, this idea that you do have to pay, in most cases, to play, is not a, a good dynamic. So mm -hmm. how do you solve that problem? And that's a really, really challenging problem because it's a legacy problem going on for a generation. How do we provide fields in every place that anybody can be within walking distance of a field where they can play, even if that's on a former basketball court in a schoolyard, right? Just put up a little net, you're not taking down the basketball court. How do you provide access in schools? Right now in basketball, you have after school programs, in school programs, every schoolyard's got a basketball court. People just play. Well, they have to go to a grassroots field to play soccer. Mm -hmm. And that that's a an obstacle to participation. So forming a giant, giant foundation and figuring out how that's structured and how do you raise money for that and how do you create the right committees for that? How do you tap into lots and lots of people who want to provide resources to fund all that? And what's it all gonna look like? That's real time stuff going on right now, literally. Really exciting. I mean, and I've seen the power of that play with kids. You know, I mean, you know my history with UNICEF and being in a refugee camp and suddenly a soccer game starts and you forget you're in a refugee camp. Like all of a sudden you're with a bunch of kids and you're just playing soccer and it's amazing. So the power of play is, is, is obviously important. And I also, you know, again, we're both old enough to remember when you had to explain the game in the United States. And now my grandchildren play soccer. I don't know about yours yet, but uh, a little young still, but you know. So, so let's go to you personally. When you think of, I just said grandchildren, what do you want your granddaughter to remember you for? Well, um, I'm going to start with the kids, right? Because our kids are pretty much around the same age, and they're in that period of time where they're starting families, thinking about career, thinking about their own lives and purposes. We spend a lot of time as a family uh, trying to figure out what could we do with the resources that we have because we're kind of blessed, right? Mm -hmm. I, I grew up in Queens. I, you know, five people in a two-bedroom apartment. It, I was an unlikely successful person. And I don't forget that. Uh, and I'm in and around a lot of people who grew up very differently than, than I did. So we found, formed a family uh, foundation. So we get together as a, as a family and think about the things that we want to do so that that could live past. What do we want to be re remembered by? Mm -hmm. What are those kinds of things that we can do that matter to, matter to our family? in ways that could live longer than just what we do. And when your kids are at that point in their lives, that uh, that's a good time to start. Uh, the grandkids, in my case, are you know three and, and one. But at the end of the day, just want to have all people think that you, you lived a life where you did good work, uh, you were a good friend, you were a good partner, you were loyal to the things that matter. To me, that's doing the right thing, not that hard, right? Just do the right thing and everything's gonna work out. Uh, try to figure out ways that you're spending enough time and energy uh, to do more than just what's for yourself. That takes time. That's not easy. I still travel 100 days a year. I've been doing this a long time. So you got to figure out ways to manage all of that and just live. You know, this is so perfect for you. I think about it all the time. Just live a life with purpose. I want to be remembered not just by being a great commissioner of a, of a sports league because that's my job. Mm -hmm. But what does all of that mean when it was done and what role did I have to play in that, particularly in a sport that is complicated, that's got a lot of challenges associated to it globally, and how can I influence all of that? And I spend a lot of my time in the international sports community, which doesn't have the governance and doesn't have the vision that we have here in North America. So that was a long way of saying, just hope people think I did something that mattered. It's interesting, we have um, a ritual in our home. Our kids are a little bit younger. They range from six to, to 14, four kids. And one of the questions we ask every night before going to bed is what is an act of radical kindness you did for someone today? Un, unprompted, un, and just, and it, it touches on this same thematic around around what, what impacts and legacy and what change, even if it was small, what kind of, what impact does that start to have in and around the people around you, the world around you, from micro to macro, and it translates to personal family discussions up to you know major league soccer. I have this theory that you know not everybody. I don't know if this was a quote I read somewhere, but not everybody could make a significant difference, but everybody ought to try, right? So if you you have an opportunity, no matter what you do, and we we talk a lot about that. MLS is small; we have 450 employees. 
You know, it's not the thousands that uh, live in the other leagues, but, you know, whether it's the groups of employees that come together, we have these employee resource groups that are representing just about every uh, aspect of how an employee base can be structured. And they they put us to task on things that we should be doing in pride. What should we be doing for working moms? And By the way, it's not even working moms anymore. It's working families. Yeah, that's right. They all get together. The dynamic in the office is so much different today. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm at the point where I think that's really important, but we need to be thinking about not what is just in it for them, but how could you package that energy so that is what it's in, in it for others. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to take all that energy and have them go out and do the things that they need to do to force us to do the right thing in the community. Sports basically is very focused right now on racial and social justice. These are not easy things to deal with. And, and to be able to uh, take the power of a league and be able to do the things that we did during the post-George Floyd issues and Black Lives Matter issues, we had all of our black players coming together right in the bubble, you know, managing a league in the pandemic, losing a billion dollars of revenue, and then getting very focused with this concept of Black Players for Change. And that organization still exists. It changed the way we manage the Rooney Rule and how we sign coaches. And think about that when you're in a, a, a team we have in Miami that's bringing in a whole Argentinian staff. Mm -hmm. They still have to go through the process of ensuring that they're going to have diversity in their their locker room and diversity leading a bunch of players. We're very, very focused on that. So I don't think it's just the days of it's just going out and having a community day. And, you know, our staff went to Governor's Island and they planted plants. Well, that's kind of good, fun, and a good day off. But it's the things that could really make a difference because the I met the other day with a player that used to play in our league. He's from the Caribbean. He's now the president of a Caribbean federation. His whole career change came from this MLS advanced program that we have where we're working with players, particularly players of color, and giving them an opportunity to fulfill their careers. That stuff really is, I get really excited yeah. about that. That guy's life changed. So you had some life changes. I did. In the, you know, um, in recent years. I'm trying to think which year, but um, how has that impacted you? You know, not not as much as it should have, probably, Carol. I, I had I had cancer in 2014. I still manage through that today. Um, I had a decision to go public with it. I felt the nature of prostate cancer was such that men need to sort of stand up and say, you, you better think about this because if you don't, you're going to end up getting jammed up. And particularly, by the way, in the black community where there are bigger issues in terms of getting tested and the like. And I've been managing through that in ways that you just have to deal with, right? It doesn't distract me. It, uh, it hasn't changed my perspective. That's probably not a good thing. Um, I think when you're running particularly a an emerging business, which is probably not a good thing after 27 years. <laughs> you know, you just make the decisions that you've got to make to manage the life the way you manage it. I was just in Germany last month, and uh, I had a bunch of meetings with Bayern Munich there. I went from there to Turkey to go to the European Champions League final, and I came home. And then I went to L.A. for an LAFC game, and that's what I do. So um, it hasn't changed my life much. I, I can't say whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think everybody's got to manage their own health in ways that work for them. I was on the phone early this morning, by the way, it was one of the reasons why I was late with a guy that I used to work with at uh, the NFL who just was diagnosed and spending time with him to help him figure out what his journey should be. I spent a lot of my time quietly on that because you know that sort of makes me feel at least I'm helping others, maybe their path will be a little different than mine. So one of the things we do on the show is we like to leave our audience with a gift. You know, we call it our swag, swag bag. And it can be a thought, it can be a quote, it can be advice. What do you got? I've been using, I was in the. I was in Columbus the other day announcing our All-Star Game for next year. And um, that was probably the worst um, dynamic in at least the my MLS journey. We were thinking about moving a team. The Cleveland Browns had moved, so the politicians in Ohio decided that they were going to come up with a law that said you can't move a pro sports team uh, unless the government gets involved. They sued the league. I got sued personally. Really traumatic. Death threats from fans. And um, we ended up being able to get the Haslam family to buy the team. The city actually stepped up and helped fund a brand new stadium that I was at the other day. 
The owner of that team moved to Austin. We've got one of our most successful teams in Austin, Texas now, a brand new downtown stadium. But it was really traumatic. Uh, the governor was at the press conference. The mayor was at the press conference. They can't get over it. You know, I was, I'm not the most popular person in uh, Columbus, Ohio. I was interviewed in the Columbus Dispatch. That was the headline. Uh, and in my press conference, I said, no pressure, no diamonds. You know, unless you put yourself to task, you're not going to basically get the jewel. In this case, this stadium is one of the crown jewels of st uh, stadiums of its size anywhere in the world. And I live kind of through that dynamic. You really have to make tough decisions and be willing uh, to be courageous, not get discouraged, uh, and have the courage to not get discouraged and to be able to wow. have focus. I've got a board of 64 people of some of the wealthiest, most powerful people in the country. And uh, there have been a lot of contentious times there. And my view is just if you have a moral compass and you have this idea of putting yourself to test, the outcome is going to be really good. So I love this no pressure, no diamonds thing. It actually was a quote in the newspaper. So good timing, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Don, thank you great. so much for coming on with us today. We really so appreciate you your so being much, here. Don. Thanks so much for joining us. Listen on Purpose is a series as part of Kindred Cast from Kindred Media and Audiation with the phenomenal music by Rachel's 10-year-old son, Noam Krauss. If you like this episode, please make sure to subscribe to Kindred Cast wherever you get your podcasts and leave a review letting us know what you think. We are your hosts, Rachel Krause and Carol Stern. Thank you for listening and find your purpose. <laughs>